Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. There's power in saying and there's apparently power in writing. He said write the vision and put it on tablets so plain that everyone who passes by can read it easily and quickly. What was he saying? Keep the vision in front of you. I want to talk to you tonight about what do you want out of life? And whatever it is you do want, what is it going to take to get it? How can you get from where you are to where you want to be? I want you to think with me for a minute. Do you have a dream for your life, for your children, for your home, for your finances, your marriage? Do you have a hope? Is there something that you're looking forward to with hope? Do you have an idea, a goal, a plan, <laughs> a vision? I believe that we need to be reaching all the time, reaching, reaching, reaching. God didn't create us for passivity or for just being static. There's something in us that has to be reaching. Part of that God factor in us is always needing to go somewhere. How many of you figured out by now God is always on the move? Amen. So if you've got your life in park, you need to get it back in drive. And if you've got it in reverse, you need to strip reverse out of your life. You should not even have a reverse gear in your life. Because you can't do or be what God wants you to be if you're looking back or going back. Proverbs 29, 18 says, without vision, the people perish. If you don't have any hope, if there's nothing you're looking forward to, then you become hopeless. And the Bible says hope deferred makes the heart sick. The worst condition you can be in is to just feel like you're in a rut, which they say is a grave with no ends, no way to get out of it. And you're just hopeless, you have no ideas, you have no plans, you have no vision, you don't see anything other than what you have going on right now and you're already sick and tired of that. And you say, well, I wish God would give me a dream. I wish God would give me a vision. Well, you know what? You don't need wishbone. You need backbone. Get a dream. Get a vision. Shut your eyes and see something better than what you have. Read your Bible and then say, that's for me. It's not just for somebody else. That's for me. The Bible talks about fighting the good fight of faith. And I can tell you what God has for you is not just going to fall on you like ripe cherries falling off a tree, you are going to have to be determined if anybody can have the life Jesus died for us to have, I'm going to be the one that's going to have it. Come on, you don't sound like fighters. So many people just wait around passively, waiting to see what's going to happen. Now, Paul says in Philippians 4, 11 through 13, that he had learned how to be content, content. So where's the balance between this contentment and this reaching? <laughs> well, we can't, we can't misunderstand that. Actually, what Paul said, if you read it in the Amplified, he said, I've learned how to be content satisfied to the point where I'm not disturbed no matter what state I'm in. So in other words, he never got upset about where he was, but he was always looking forward to where he could be. How many of you understand that? It's kind of like learning how to enjoy where you're at on the way to where you're going. Learning how to be content while you're making the journey. Now, you know, I had a big dream and a vision, but I didn't understand the contentment part and the enjoying where you're at part on the way to where you're going. And so I spent a lot of my years with, my, with the dream and the vision that God put in my heart tormenting me. Because I didn't understand a lot of the things that I'm privileged to teach now about not despising the day of small beginnings and how everything takes patience and endurance and, you know, how we need to appreciate the things we do have and not get all caught up in, you know, what we don't have. And when somebody has made a journey, 
they're a wise person to listen to about the journey. <laughs> That's why the Bible tells us to listen to older people. Not that I'm old by any stretch of the imagination, but I have been around for a few years and I've gone through a lot of things and I've been teaching the Word for a long time and I know that you can do great things in your life and still be very happy through each step of that journey. We are not created by God for boring sameness. <laughs> Amen? I did something for me today that was outrageous. I think that we should do at least one outrageous thing a week, don't you? I mean, some really out-of-the-box thing. You say, what did you do? Well, I'll tell you, it was so shocking that everybody at my table went, I am very picky about what I eat. I don't eat a lot, so I want to really like what I eat. And I like good food. And so we went to a really nice restaurant here in town today. And uh, what was the name of it? I'll recommend it. Huh? Post Oak Grill. It was really, really had, they re had very nice food. So I went there and, you know, of course, when you haven't been to a place before, you don't really know anything. So I'm asking all these questions. Well, what's good? Well, which salad's the best? Well, what's your soup? And, you know, the guy was really friendly. He'd been there 15 years. And so he was telling me all these things. And I'm asking about the fish. And I'm asking about this and that. And, you know, and he asked me a couple questions. He said, I'll tell you what. Why don't you just let me surprise you? <laughs> now... Never, ever, ever in a million years would have I have said okay to that. But I looked at him, I said, yeah, why don't you do that? That's cool. The people at my table were like, <laughs> they were so shocked. I, I still don't even know why I did it. But I guess I just needed to get out of the box and try a little something different. Amen? Because you see, for me, that was downright dangerous. <laughs> because he could have messed up my meal for today. Amen? We're not created for boring sameness. If nothing else, take a different route to work. Do something. My daughter went recently and wanted to get her hair cut differently, and so <laughs> she told the girl to do whatever she wanted to. Well, she will never do that again. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> yeah, well, pressing on. <laughs> but when you do have a vision, when you do have a dream, you have to keep it in front of you. You have to keep it in front of you because if you don't, life will suck it up. How many of you know it's pretty easy just in life to lose your dreams, your visions, your hopes, you know, whatever, and think, well, it's got too many other things to think about. But I'd like us to look at a scripture that we're probably familiar with, but so good to, to see it again afresh. Habakkuk 2, 1 through 3, talking about keeping the vision that God gives us in front of us. Oh, I know I've been rash to talk out plainly this way to God. I will in my thinking stand upon my post of observation and station myself on the tower of fortress and I will watch to see what he will say within me and what answer I will make as his mouthpiece to the perplexities of my complaint against him. So Habakkuk was boldly complaining <laughs> like nothing is happening, I'm getting weary, I'm getting tired of this, when is something good going to happen to me? Did anybody sound like that this week? Come on. God, I need some good news. Amen. I pray for good news all the time. I need some good news. I love it when somebody sends me an email and starts out, I've got good news. Or I get a phone call. I've got good news. I don't like the bad news stuff. And the Lord answered me and said, now watch this, write the vision and engrave it so plainly upon tablets that everyone who passes may be able to read it easily and quickly as he hastens by. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. It hastens to the end fulfillment. 
It will not deceive or disappoint. Though it tarry, wait earnestly for it because it will surely come. It will not be behindhand on its appointed day. That ought to be good news to somebody. Amen. You know, it could be something as simple as you have a vision to lose weight. You have a vision to get your house in order. You have a vision to get out of debt. You have a vision for worldwide ministry. You want to sing on the worship team. You want to see your marriage improve. You want to get married. I mean, it can be anything. We're certainly not just relegating this to some kind of pulpit ministry. God wants you to dream. He wants you to plan, and He doesn't want you to let life steal your dreams and visions, and He doesn't want you to let fear steal your dreams and visions. Fear is the master demon spirit. I think really fear is at the root of everything. I think it's even at the root of pride, which probably is involved in almost every sin. Fear, 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 fear. So many times when something's going wrong, I'll say, God, what's wrong here? And here, I'll hear it again. Fear, fear, fear. That little girl that gave the testimony tonight. I'm sure that was just a spirit of fear that attacked her. Just attacked her. And you know what? When we're being attacked, we have to rise up against it. She had to have something to rise up against that with. And even just being able to get out of bed and say, something good's going to happen to me today. That puts the devil in his place. And you know what? I talk about this a lot, but God just will not leave me alone about it. And so I have to talk about it here again tonight. It is so important that you open your mouth and speak the word out loud. There's power in saying. And there's apparently power in writing. He said, write the vision and put it on tablets so plain that everyone who passes by can read it easily and quickly. What was he saying? Keep the vision in front of you. I've kept journals for 32 years. I have them in a huge plastic tub. And it is so amazing when I look back at some of my journals in the early years and some of the, some of the things that I was talking to God about. And <laughs> and to see how God brought me through every one of those things. And so many times I didn't think I could make it. And it it's wonderful to have a, a record of what God has brought you through. And sometimes I love to just get out some of the really old ones. And I found some entries when I was going to, going to do a meeting in Kansas City one night. And we were just on radio then. And I, man, I was just believing God to just have people in the room. Just people, you know. And I mean, I remember when I was still just believing God for skillets and wash rags and you know, things like that. And it's just like, God is so faithful. So you need to write down your victories. You need, to, you need to keep a book of remembrance of all the great things that God does for you. Because you can use those as warfare when you're in a tough time. It's good to go back and remember the things that God has done for you. But saying out loud, words are creative God said, that's one of the first things that's recorded in the Bible, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God said, and God said, and God said, and God said, and in Luke 4, the devil said to Jesus, and Jesus said to the devil, and in Genesis, the serpent said to Eve. <laughs> let me tell you something, the devil's got his mouth going, you better get yours going. And I mean get it going in the right direction. I did a series a couple of months ago on the strategies of Satan, and I, thought, I just felt like once again we needed to be reminded that the devil is alive and well on planet Earth. We have authority over him. We're not fighting for victory. We're fighting from victory. But we have to take our position. We have to speak out against him. We have to stand up to him. We have to resist these spirits that try to discourage us and disappoint us and bring us into despair and depression and tell us we're never going to see anything good happen in our lives. You've got to fight. In 2 Timothy 1, 5 through 7, we see that Timothy had become afraid. 
with good reason. He was a protege of Paul, and everywhere Paul went, he was being persecuted and imprisoned and beaten. Who wouldn't be afraid if that was your best buddy? Amen? I'm sure that Timothy, as a young preacher, saw the things that was happening to Paul and thought, my gosh, do I really want to do this? Can I do this? I mean, I don't know if I can go through what you're going through. And Paul lovingly chastised him, and he said, I remember the faith that your mother had and the faith that your grandmother had, and that same faith is in you. Now, you stir up that faith. You stir up that gift within you. You rekindle those embers, those flames that are about to go out. For God hath not given you a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. Amen? And I think there's somebody here in the building tonight that needs to shake off that weariness that's gotten a hold of you. And you need to come full circle again and say, I'm going to see my dreams come to pass. God is a God of faithfulness. He will defeat my enemies. He is my vindicator. God is my vindicator. Amen? Don't let weariness and our age steal your dream. Let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 3, the first two verses. Now, the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli... And the word of the Lord was rare and precious in those days, and there was no frequent or widely spread vision. People didn't have much vision. And at that time, Eli, who was the prophet, whose eyesight had dimmed so that he could not see, was lying down in his own place. Everybody say he was lying down. <laughs> now, that doesn't sound like a bad thing. Why can't the guy lie down? Well, but verse 3 says, the lamp of God had not yet gone out in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was, and Samuel was lying down. So in other words, the lights were still on. There was still stuff to be doing. <laughs> but he'd already gone to bed. He was weary. He was tired. He'd lost his edge. There was no widely spread vision in those days because the prophet wasn't keeping one stirred up among the people. I've come here tonight to stir you up. Amen. I've come to you as a mouthpiece from God to remind you of some things that you know and to tell you how awesome you are and how wonderful you are and, and how you are so full of possibilities and so full of opportunity. And you can be unhappy if you want to be, but you don't have to be if you don't want to be. He whom the Son has set free is free indeed. So if you go on down a little bit further in 1 Samuel to verse 10, and the Lord came and stood and called, as at other times, <clears throat> Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel answered, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And the Lord told Samuel, Behold, I'm about to do a thing in Israel at which both ears of all who hear it shall tingle. On that day I will perform against Eli all that I have spoken against his house from beginning to end. And I now announce to him that I will judge and punish his house forever for the iniquity of which he knew, for his sons were bringing a curse upon themselves, blaspheming God, and he did not restrain them. So you see, he had gotten so passive and so lazy in spirit he wasn't even dealing with issues that needed to be dealt with anymore. His own sons were having prostitutes in the, the temple doorway, and Eli wasn't even correcting them. He just went to bed, took a nap. You got to stay sharp. Yes, I get tired of correcting people. When you have 900 employees or something you're dealing with all the time. I get tired of being disappointed by people. I get tired of people not telling you the truth. I get tired of people saying they're one thing and being something else. But I refuse to get to the point where I don't trust anybody, and I refuse to get a bad attitude because there's more good in this world than there is evil. The problem is, is all we ever hear about is the evil. I wish we had a good news channel. 
I mean, would that not be awesome? Can't you understand that everything, Satan is the God of this world system, and everything that's going on right now is geared toward pulling everybody down and just sucking the life out of you. What's the use? Can't trust anybody. You better fight that attitude because you are the one that's going to get hurt more than anybody else. And God will be so disappointed. I'll tell you what, I know that God does not need anybody to feel sorry for him, but I feel sorry for God. I mean, I'm just apologizing to him all the time for everybody's stupidity. It's like, oh God, I'm so sorry. Lord, I'm so sorry that you have to put up with this. When he's so good and he's done so much for us. And there's such unbelievable possibility. My goodness. And the stuff going on in the world today. Well, Samuel was being called by God to replace Eli. Because God had to get a man with fresh faith. Is anybody listening to me tonight? God had to get a man with fresh faith. Now, you know, we know that as people age, they're always passing the torch onto the younger generation, and that's cool. That's part of their inheritance. But you know what? I ain't passing my torch onto anybody until there's not one flicker of it left <laughs> in me. Amen. I'll get other people prepared. And you know what? You, you have to fight that thing. It's like, well, I'm getting older now. I mean, you, you watch. Now, I know if you're 20, you don't get this. But if you're 50 or 60 or 65, now I'm thinking... Three and a half years and I will be 70. I can't think like that. It's like, who? Eat right, look good, feel good, got energy, go work out. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Samuel just got, Eli just got old. He got tired. He was laying down when he should have been out. You know what got David in trouble? At the time of the year when kings went to battle, David stayed home. And it was that night that he saw Bathsheba on the roof. If he would have been where he should have been, out doing battle like a king should have been doing, he wouldn't have had the mess he got into. Come on. I don't feel like going to church today. Well, you know what? You need to be there a whole lot more than they need you to be there. Don't act like you're doing somebody a favor if you go. God told me one time, why don't you stop acting like you're doing me a favor when you read the Bible? I already know it. You're reading it for yourself. Come on. It's like, oh, I get brownie points. I read three chapters today. Somebody in this building needs to decide tonight to finish your race. I'm tired of people who start everything and finish nothing. Well, I would like to encourage you today to always have a goal for your future. Have a dream, something that you want to see happen. We sometimes say, do you have a vision for your life? And it just means, do you have something in your heart that you want to see happen? I believe that really God has created us to be goal-oriented. I think we always need to have something that we're reaching for. So let me ask a question. What do you see for yourself? What do you want out of life? Don't get discouraged in your waiting time because things do take time. But just remember some of the things that God has done for you in the past, some of the things that He's done for other people, and remember that He will do it again. So keep that dream out in front of you and keep walking toward it and don't get discouraged.